you hate government, one of them libertarian types, or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers. Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. All right, you guys, welcome back. Our next guest on the show today is Daniel Larison from the American Conservative Magazine. He's been writing a lot about the Iran deal and Yemen, too. Welcome back. How are you doing? Uh, just fine, Scott. Thanks for having me back. Uh, very happy to have you here. And, um, you know, I forget if I said this out loud or I only thought it later or what, but when Tom Woods was interviewing me about the Iran nuclear deal the other day, I definitely at least meant to say, you know what? Just ask Daniel Larison. He'll tell you. He's from the American <laughs> Conservative Magazine. He can make the case better than me. Uh, you seem okay. to be pretty convinced that this Iran deal is better than the status quo or the next most possible future. Do I have that right? Yeah, I, I think it is. I think it, it does a number of things that are beneficial uh, both for us and, and for the Iranians and, and for the wider region. Uh, I, I think the, the most important thing from our side is that it – finally addresses the nuclear issue in a way that's satisfactory to Washington and to the other major powers, uh, which I believe greatly reduces the chance that there's going to be uh, any sort of uh, so-called pre preventive attack on Iran uh, over the nuclear issue. And I think it, in that it makes that prospect much less likely, uh, that's, that's a huge win for us uh, in that it keeps us from getting drawn into yet another conflict in the region well, when we're already involved in far too many. Uh, and, and certainly that's, a, that's also a win for all of the countries in the region that won't be sucked into the conflict along with us. Uh, and obviously uh, on the Iranian side, uh, not being attacked, uh, not being starved and sanctioned uh, in the way that they have been over the last several years uh, is to their advantage as well. Uh, the, the other thing that I think it does, uh, it, it definitely advances the cause of nonproliferation. Uh, it does put meaningful limits and monitoring on the Iranian nuclear program so that in the event that there were a desire on their part to try to build a nuclear weapon, that would become evident and there would be ways to, to discourage them from doing, from proceeding along that line. Uh, and it's also, uh, very much to the advantage of Iranian civil society because they're finally going to be allowed to, to breathe again and these sanctions that have been crippling them are going to be lifted, um, which will in turn make it much harder for the regime to keep uh, squeezing them as much as it has. All right. So um, first of all, let's start with that point right there. Uh, that is an important point. It's one that's been made at least from time to time over the years that you know, and hey, Iran's far away, so it's kind of hard for Americans to see these things going on. But they've got their right wing hawks that uh, hate the great Satan and don't want to deal with us and that uh, like to use the excuse that anybody who opposes them must be working for the Americans. We saw a lot of that in 2009. The whole green movement was discredited as a CIA plot when I don't think much of it was anyway. I mean, certainly America, the American government supported it. I don't think they invented it. Um, uh, but And it's something that student activists and so forth have, have had to put up with uh, over the years there. And as, uh, geez, I guess Scott Ritter said, you know, a decade ago, yeah, the moderates are the enemy. The Iranian moderates are the enemies of the American hawks. They want to silence those voices and make it look like only the hawks have sway in Tehran. And so what you're saying is the opposite of that. Now that we have this deal, that this is really good for the moderates, it makes them write about something very important in Iranian politics. Uh, yes, well, it's going to, it should yield uh, very tangible benefits for uh, Iranians generally and, and specifically for the Iranian middle class that has been squeezed very badly over the last few years. And, and really they are going to be the, the foundation of any significant movement for social and political reform inside the country. And uh, anything that works to their advantage is going to undermine the position of, of Iran's hardliners, which I, I think we could only 
be glad to see. Uh, I mean, obviously, our hardliners aren't glad to see that because they, they sort of feed off of the antagonism between Iran and uh, the U.S. And, and regional clients. So by undermining the, the grip that hardliners have on within their own country, uh, that could eventually help to reduce tensions between Iran and uh, the surrounding countries as well. All right. Now, so, yeah, now that's a real important point, too, because, of course, really with all American foreign policies, there's the truth, and then there are a lot of competing narratives against that. And the biggest competing narrative here, other than just the nuclear program itself, which we'll get back to, but is that by normalizing relations with Iran, really, ah, oh, we're, uh, you know, appeasing their hegemony. We're, we're allowing them. We're giving away the entire store, not just letting them keep their nuclear program, but sanctifying Iranian expansion and domination of the region. And so even though their nuclear program is being scaled back from, you know, 20 miles an hour to five or however you want to characterize it, that kind of thing, and the, the Saudis and the rest of the GCC have that much less to worry about when it comes to that, they still are pushing this entire narrative, and maybe it's true that America is moving more toward, um, as, as Pat Buchanan says in his article that's running today, in fact, uh, opening up our options for, uh, and in fact, I think Scott McConnell talks about this as well in your magazine, um, uh, opening up the options for, for allying with the Iranians and working with the Iranians in a more open way on issues like fighting al-Qaeda and the Islamic State and other things in the region that were always completely off the table because of the nuclear program. So um, maybe the critics are right that actually, oh, we're backstabbing all of our great allies in favor of these uh, Iranian mad mullahs. Well, and I, I don't know that I would go that far. Uh, but what I think we are, what we are going to see is that there will be some greater acknowledgement of where Iran and the U.S. have common security interests in the region. Uh, but we we're clearly seeing uh, almost a desperate attempt by the administration to keep placating uh, the Gulf states and Israel by sending loads more weapons to them. Uh, in one report this week, I think I saw that they were proposing that the annual uh, aid to Israel be increased from the, the $3.1 billion that it is to uh, a higher figure. So there's, there's a desire to try to, to buy off these clients and to prove that, in fact, there is no realignment going on. There is no uh, major change in our regional policy. And, I mean, unfortunately, I think that's the case, that there, there won't be a major change. Uh, I think the the good news is that, at least as far as the conflict with Iran goes, uh, that has become much less likely. Uh, whether we continue to back our clients in their obsessions with battering Yemen, for instance, uh, in their fear of Iran, uh, is, is another question. It seems like we're, we're happy to do that, or the government is happy to do that. Mm -hmm. So, in other words, we can still keep up our Cold War against them in a lot of ways, and don't necessarily have to change just because we've got this biggest issue out of the way. What it does mean is now war is off the table finally as long as we have this deal. I I believe so, yeah. Yeah. And funny to think because I saw even uh, Bill Crystal was retweeting and, and adding his own comment to something that uh, Aaron David Miller said that they gave up something they didn't have in order to get all this money. Of course, it's their money, but never mind that. Point is... Here's Bill Crystal even making the argument that, man, they weren't even making nuclear weapons. And now we're lifting all the sanctions just for them to continue not making nuclear weapons. Seems kind of silly. But, hey, that was the position that they put us in, right? The Bill uh, Crystal well, and his well, merry men. Sure. Well, and of course, the point or the response to that would be that the sanctions were put in place in order to, to the extent that they were of any value, uh, they were put in place to dissuade Iran from pursuing a nuclear weapon. And so once that, once Iran is committed, once again, not to doing that, of course, they'd already committed to not do that under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. But it, by accepting these even more stringent standards that go above and beyond what the NPT requires, uh, Iran is demonstrating that they, they don't intend 
to pursue that sort of weapon. All right, hold it right uh, there. It's so, Daniel Larison. I'm sorry, yeah, I got to go. Daniel Larison from the American Conservative Magazine. We'll be right back in just a sec, y'all. Don't you get sick of the Israel lobby trying to get us into more wars in the Middle East? Or always abusing Palestinians with your tax dollars? It once seemed like the lobby would always have full-spectrum dominance on the foreign policy discussion in D.C. But those days are over. The Council for the National Interest is the America Lobby, standing up and pushing back against the Israel Lobby's undue influence on Capitol Hill. Go show some support at CouncilForTheNationalInterest.org. That's CouncilForTheNationalInterest.org. All right, guys, welcome back. I'm Scott Horton. I'm talking with Daniel Larrison. He teaches peace in the pages of the American Conservative magazine and at his great blog there at theamericanconservative.com slash author slash Larrison. We're talking about the Iran deal and uh, conflict, and I'm sorry we were interrupted by the heartbreak, uh, Daniel. You were finishing up a thought there about how uh, the threat of war uh, has really been uh, pushed aside if the threat of the Cold War has not here. Uh, right, and I, I think that that's I think that's one of the, the great gains uh, for our side out of this. And, and the, the really, I think the, the great news for the U.S. is that this was achieved simply by accepting a compromise, admittedly a compromise we could have had a decade ago, but a compromise that acknowledges that their nuclear program is going to remain in place uh, in some form, but that as long as it's kept under uh, reasonable limits, uh, there's no reason why we can't live with that. Uh, and, and arguably there's a reason why we couldn't live with them with a much more advanced nuclear program either, but that's that's another debate. Uh, well, what we have right now is a, a, a very successful compromise that actually costs the U.S. nothing. And that this is the point I think needs to be emphasized even more in talking about it and in, in trying to persuade people of the merits of this deal the U.S. gives up nothing except the punitive measures that it has been imposing on Iran. In other words, we, we lose nothing and we gain the benefits uh, of this compromise, uh, which include making a new war less likely. And so all of the, the costs and risks that would go along with that new war are also fading away or, or becoming much less likely to happen. And that it seems like that's a, a great success for our foreign policy, uh, for a change. And one that makes uh, the avoidance of war uh, more certain. All right now, then again, we've been fighting for Iran in Iraq for the last uh, what fourteen, thirteen, twelve years here, whatever. Um, and I know it's it's a funny quirk of history that George Bush refused to talk to them the whole time he was fighting a war for them and for the most Iranian-backed parties, the Dawa and Supreme Islamic Council and the Bada Brigades there. Uh, in through through the whole Iraq War, and it looks like, hey, at least de facto right now we have a joint operation between the Iranian special forces, the American Air Force and Navy, and uh, Shiite militias on the ground led by the Badr Corps uh, attacking Fallujah. And that's the shape of the war against the Islamic State, at least in the former Iraq. Uh, it's a much more divided and and uh, quote unquote confused policy in Syria anyway. But so. Do you worry that maybe this is going to lead to a full-scale kind of alliance uh, with them again in Iraq? Because, well, I'll just say one more thing about it. It seems like if that's who rousts the Islamic State out of Fallujah and Mosul and Ramadi, if that's even possible, then you have a real problem with hardcore Shiite around Iran-backed sectarians occupying those cities or, you know, being in charge of their, quote, reconstruction where they choose the new Sunni leaders of them or, or however that's supposed to work. That just seems like a whole new mess of details, uh, you know, more blowback to come. Well, I, I, I certainly think our I've, – I've been saying for some time that our involvement in the war on ISIS doesn't make sense for us, that it's not necessary for us. And it, it does put us in these uh, very ugly compromises with – uh, sectarian militias with the sectarian government in Baghdad. Uh, and, that, and that was true from the, the beginning when we first got involved when Maliki was still in charge. Uh, that, I mean, I, that's something that would need to be addressed as, as a way to fix our, our policies in Iraq and Syria. Uh, I, I suppose by, by concluding the deal 
um, we, we may actually have a little bit more freedom to to back away from that sort of collusion with uh, Iran-backed forces. But it, it's not clear at all that there's any desire to make use of that freedom to to extricate ourselves from this conflict. Um, so I, I, I think I mean, that's an ongoing problem, but that's that's got to do with our preoccupation with with fighting ISIS. Uh, quite apart from anything else that's going on in the region. Mm-hmm. I see what you mean. That I, I think I see what you mean. You're saying that um, if we're getting along better with the Iranians now, then it's less of a worrisome talking point that, oh, no, the Iranians are the ones fighting the Islamic State instead of us. So that makes it easier to go ahead and just let them and, and let it be them instead of us, because who cares? Right. Well, and, and in, well, in an acknowledgment that they're the regional power that has the incentive to fight them, uh, and obviously our regional clients and, and allies, in in the case of the Saudis and the Turks, clearly are not making that a priority and are, and are in fact, working on the other side to some extent. So there's, uh, I, I would see that as a, a, certainly a better arrangement uh, is letting the Iranians take responsibility for it. And I, I wouldn't be concerned, as many hawks are, about being accused of so-called losing Iraq uh, to them, is that that was already done a, a decade ago. Yeah. Um, all right, so now, uh, what about GOP politics? Because you've written quite a bit about this, the different Republican candidates and their stands on this deal. But then, I think it's one of your most recent blog entries here is, uh, yeah, second to last, is about the poll results that show that even Republicans pretty much support this deal, especially you tell them the alternative is invasion, if that's the only way to make sure that there's no nuclear program at all there, which is supposedly the only definition of a good deal, even according to Rand Paul. Um, So, But then, uh, as Tom Woods was pointing out to me on his show the other day, that you know by the time of the election, this thing will have been going on, the, the deal will have been in effect for more than a year at that point. And if the Iranians are abiding by it and everything is really cool, they're going to be, and this is a deal the American people in general already supported anyway, then they're all taking their stand. They have their consensus among Republicans, and they think it stands for the consensus of the American voters but or even the Republican voters, but it's really not looking like it. So what do you think is going to happen with that? I, I think it is going to be a liability for whoever ends up getting the Republican nomination uh, because they have taken such a, a reflexive and uncompromising position, and not just against adopting the deal, but, but going farther and saying that they will repudiate it as soon as they have the opportunity. Uh, and that's clearly not what the public endorses. Uh, the, the one survey uh, from the Washington Post this week showed that uh, over just over 40 percent of Republicans are in favor of the deal. So there, there's a large constituency inside the party that's not being heard at all and is not being represented in the presidential field, uh, but which is fairly extraordinary uh, when you think that this would be, because it is one of the most important foreign policy issues, that there would be at least some uh, dissent somewhere. Uh, but but unfortunately, that, that seems to be the one issue on which there's pretty much total uniformity. Mm. Well, it would be fun kind of to see the GOP completely impale themselves again on their foreign policy and then wonder why do people like the Democrats when that's not it. That surely is not it. <laughs> it's just right. that they're worse. That's all. They prove it over and over again. If that's even possible, they prove it. All right. Thanks, Daniel. You're the best, man. Thanks, Scott. That's Daniel Larrison. He's at the American Conservative dot com. Hey, Al Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new book by Michael Swanson, The War State. In The War State, Swanson examines how Presidents Truman, Eisenhower, and Kennedy both expanded and fought to limit the rise of the new national security state after World War II. This nation is ever to live up to its creed of liberty and prosperity for everyone. We are going to have to abolish the empire. Know your enemy. Get The War State by Michael Swanson. It's available at your local bookstore or at Amazon.com in Kindle or in paperback. Just click the book in the right margin at scotthorton.org or thewarstate.com. Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at WallStreetWindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. 
WallStreetWindow.com. I love Bitcoin, but there's just something incredibly satisfying about having real, fine silver in your pocket. That's why commodity disks are so neat. They're one-ounce rounds of fine silver with a QR code on the back. Just grab your smartphone's QR reader, scan the coin, and you'll instantly get the silver spot price in Federal Reserve Notes and Bitcoin. And if you donate 100 bucks to The Scott Horton Show, he'll send you one. Learn more at facebook.com slash commodity disks. Commoditydisks.com.